Okay, well, welcome to the WARMS um, review of Weather, Soils, and Waters for 2016. Today, uh, we're going to take you through the data collected through the Water and Atmospheric Resources Monitoring Program, or WARM for short. WARM has four long-term monitoring networks, starting with the Illinois Climate Network that has 19 stations across the state, which takes five-minute data of the weather and hourly data of the soils. We have the shallow groundwater network, which has for more than 60 years been collecting data on the water table levels of the state. We have the sediment monitoring network that collects uh, suspended sediment data in Illinois' rivers and streams. We're not gonna be talking about that one today, but lots of interesting information about it on our website. Also, you'll hear about the Reservoir Observation Network. They have been collecting, they have more than 30 years worth of data on res end of the month reservoir levels in reservoirs in central and southern Illinois. Altogether, the warm networks collect more than 2 million uh, data points annually. We're going to talk about those combined with data from the USGS, the National Weather Service, and the Army Corps of Engineers to try to give you a broader view about what just happened in the state. And to start, we'll have Jim Angel talking about the weather. We'll talk about the, the weather and climate of 2016. And to kind of start off with, we got some highlights and actually, I'll kind of sneak back into 2015 a little bit because it kind of sets the stage for some of the conditions we saw in 2016. So on December we had, of 2015, we had the second wettest December on record. And then the two other precipitation records of note in 2016 were very wet July, second wet, third wettest July, and second wettest August. And when you combine those two together, you get the wettest July-August on record. So extraordinary rainfall the, the, this last summer, uh, really outstanding in that regard. And our statewide numbers go back to 1895, so that kind of span of whatever that is, 125 years or so of, of data. Let's see here. So this was the precipitation from back in December of 2015. Uh, this is the whole month, but almost, or pretty much all of that fell uh, right after the Christmas uh, break there. Uh, so this is the, the accumulated precipitation. So that's the water from any rainfall plus the water content of any snow. And so all the areas that are in blue got at least five inches and the lighter shades of blues, it goes all the way up to 10 to 12 inches. So there's the, that, that large, uh, I don't want to call it winter storm, but it, it was only be considered a winter storm in the fact that it happened at the end of December. It actually behaved more like what you might see in early fall or in springtime. So a very wet system moved up across from uh, Oklahoma, and, uh, Oklahoma and Texas and then on up through uh, Missouri and Illinois. And in fact, some of the probably the heaviest amounts were in Missouri and Illinois. And it was pretty well forecasted. They uh, 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 were, had their sights set on, on the high rainfall amounts from this storm several days ahead of time, uh, right before Christmas there. So when this hit right after Christmas, they should have been prepared, or at least somewhat prepared for that. Uh, so just an extraordinary, extraordinary amount of rain. A little bit of snow in the northern part of the state, but for the most part, it fell as rain out of this particular storm. It turns out about 10 days later, I was down in New Orleans, as they say down there, not New Orleans, but New Orleans, uh, and they had record flooding, and it was that water from that storm had finally made its way down into uh, the, the lower part of the Mississippi River there. So that was just right outside the hotel. So if you look closely, you can probably see some pieces of Illinois floating by <laughs> in that photo. So here's the monthly precipitation departures uh, for 2016. So if they're yellow, they're below normal, and if they're green, they're above normal. So you can see the first six months were actually pretty uh, pretty dry across the state, and then you can see those big spikes in July and August, and then we turn dry again. So it's kind of this kind of Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of personality of 2016. 
So we were actually kind of worried about drought as, as we got to the end of June here, but then once it started to rain in July and August, we had the opposite problems. We had a lot of places that were starting to get flooding in fields. I know at home, I was mowing the grass every week this whole summer. I don't think the grass ever did turn brown. Uh, so that's, that's pretty unusual for us. So as a result, as we get into September, we actually had soil moisture that was fully recharged. Like in some places we had too much, we actually had saturated soils. So there's actually a little bit of concern about uh, what that might do to the fall harvest because of all that, that uh, precipitation. But fortunately, it turned dry, especially in October, well, second half of September, and then on in October and November were, were very dry. So uh, the farmers caught a break on that one, and so it didn't uh, inhibit uh, f harvest too much. So going back, this is the dry January through June period. Uh, and then in terms of precipitation departures, so the areas in the kind of the oranges there uh, in western Illinois were actually in pretty dire straits. Uh, you know, everybody, some places were six to eight to ten inches below normal on precipitation. That was, I, I, by the end of June, I was actually calling western Illinois as being in drought because that, they were really starting to feel the effects over there. Here's the widespread rains across the state and really across the Midwest. Uh, during that July August time frame so this is the departure from from normal for those two months so you know everybody had six nine ten twelve inches of extra precipitation during those that two month time period and it was pretty much statewide so that pretty much wiped out any concerns about drought then we get into the fall and we have the areas that are kind of shades of yellow there we're a little on the dry side so again western Illinois kind of slipped back into drought conditions and we actually had some other concerns down in far southern Illinois there with uh, drought as well. They had a lot of trouble with drought in Kentucky, and it looked like it was going to jump the river into Illinois, but it didn't quite make it, I think in part because we had so much rain in that uh, July-August time frame with, you know, as soils fully recharged, they were able to weather this, uh, this fall droughtiness uh, pretty well. So recently, in terms of the temperature side of things, this last winter, so that'd be December of last year and then January, February of 2016, uh, we was the sixth warmest on record, thanks to El Nino. And then March, you had a fairly warm March there. And then we had uh, the second warmest fall on record. And 2016 as a whole ended up being the fifth warmest uh, on record with about 2.4 degrees above the long-term average. And so these are the bar plots of the uh, temperature departures. So orange is uh, above normal and blue is below normal. So that kind of accident that orange and blue were selected for this. But, uh, so, <laughs> uh, so you can see that pretty much all the months were very warm. We just had the only cool months were May and December. Everybody else was warm. So it probably falls pretty naturally that we would have uh, uh, one of the warmest years on record. And you can really see, especially in that uh, July through November period, we had some pretty warm temperatures a across the state. So that I would say probably temperature-wise, the outstanding feature was that very warm fall, the second warmest on record. Now, finally, I'll just mention this, just kind of put this in the, the bigger context. So this is the annual temperature for Illinois. Uh, for, since 1895 to present, kind of the hallmark of Illinois' temperature records, they go back and forth quite a bit from year to year. There's a lot of year-to-year -year variability. We're in the middle of the continent. We don't have oceans to moderate our temperatures. And so we can get some pretty big swings. In fact, it's about plus or minus four degrees over the long-term average. And, but on top of that, there's this green line, which is a, kind of a running average or smoother to kind of help your eyeball track the, the bigger trends. And you can see that it, we've had kind of a warming trend up through the 1940s, then it kind of cooled off a little bit. And since then, we've actually been warming up quite a bit. So in the last, oh, I'd say 20, 30 years, we're probably seeing some of the warmest temperatures in Illinois, at least in the historical record. Uh, so really outstanding there. And you can see 2014, you know, that was that, that one really cold year we had. And we call that cold because Compared to our experience from about here onward, that was cold, but if you look at some of the numbers in here, especially the earlier part of the record, that was nothing to write home about with that coolness there. But what we have seen is a lot of really warm years in the last 20 years of the record. So that 2016 uh, is, is right up there, and right now we've got, we just finished up with the 
the 10th warmest January, so maybe 2017 is going to be another warm year. So I'll turn it back over to you, Jenny. Okay, and now I'm going to talk about soil. So Jen's talked a little bit about it for me. Uh, basically, we're seeing very similar patterns in soil temperatures to what we saw with air temperatures. Uh, just a little background, the Illinois Climate Network collects soil temperatures at two, four, and eight inches at, nine, at 19 stations across the state, two and four inches under bare soil, and four and eight inches under sod. This is a plot of soil temperature at the average for the state at four inches under bare soil, the blue being what we saw for 2016, the orange being a 13-year long-term average. And basically the take-home message is it was warm with the soils as, as well during 2016. Um, basically we see throughout the entire year that the 2016 average is generally above the historical. Uh, a few places to point out, here in March, we see a spike with um, soil temperatures getting up to 60 degrees, which is about 15 to 20 degrees above the long-term average. So that's actually pretty warm soils in March. I know I had people calling me wanting to know if they could start planting at that point in time. We also <coughs> see warm temperatures through the summer, but the really big thing, at least for me, is the high soil temperatures we see in the fall. Fall was pretty warm. We were seeing averages of five to six degrees above the long-term average. In fact, going into the end of November, beginning of December, we are still seeing soil temperatures statewide averaging about 40 degrees, which is pretty high for us. Now that's the state average. What was happening regionally? Um, to explain this graph real quickly, blue are our southern stations. The yellow are east, east central stations, black is west central, and north is, I mean, excuse me, orange is our northern stations. And things pretty much fall like you expect. Northern stations cooler, southern stations warmer. But, and we see some differences here. Um, here in February of 2016, we see increases in soil temperature actually getting into the 50 degrees in some of our southern stations, which we don't see at the northern stations. We also see at the end of the year, here in December, we see a decrease in temperatures in the southern and central stations, but we're not really seeing that in our northern stations. But overall, temperatures throughout the state were warmer than normal in 2016. And just to take a look at this underside, once again, blue is 2016, the orange is historical. We're seeing pretty much the same thing, though not as much variation because the sod is acting as a bit of an insulator. We are seeing those high temperatures in um, March, not quite reaching 60, but still about 15 degrees above normal. And we're even seeing a larger difference in temperatures between the historical and 2016 when we look at that warm fall. In fact, for under sod, temperatures were averaging six to seven degrees above normal for the fall. And once again, we're seeing the same thing when we look at it regionally. Peaks in southern and central Illinois in February going into March, not really seeing that in the north. A cooling spell in central and southern Illinois that we're not really catching in northern Illinois. But overall, temperatures were warmer than normal. If we take a look at this um, for our terms of record, these are the annual averages. Um, the blue is four inches under sod, and the orange is four inches under bare soil. For four inches <coughs> under sod, we are seeing a general upward trend since 1989. <clears throat> under bare soil, we have um, data back to 2003. We're not really seeing an upward trend. Don't quite know why, but something we're definitely gonna take a further look at. The Illinois Climate Network monitors soil moisture at six um, depths from two inches to 59 inches. This is the average uh, soil moisture at two inches for 2016 in the blue. The orange is the historical with the daily precipitation average for 2016 here at the bottom. 
And what we're seeing is pretty much the pattern that Jim was talking about with precipitation. We see um, basically a high soil moisture in the spring. We see this decline here in April as things begin to dry out a little bit. We see a much larger decline here in June as we're coming up with several months of below average rainfall. But then with the rains in July and August, we definitely see a recharge. And once again, another dry period here in November. So it's pretty much following the pattern we expect with the precipitation. Looking at this regionally, the blue being the southern stations, we see that they actually pretty much stayed very moist throughout most of the spring, though we do see some fluctuations in central and northern Illinois. Though the entire state dried out here during the June period, and as we go on to the fall, we see a separation of the black line, which is the west central stations, as they became drier. That being said, the real take home message here is though we did have dry periods, we didn't have any very dry periods. Nothing hit the wilting points here. So everything was above the wilting points, and we did see some periods in which soil moisture was at or above field capacity. We see a same pattern when we look at soil moisture at depths of eight inches a drying pattern in April, another one in June, a recharge with the rains in July and August, and drying again in November. And once again, we look at it regionally, same pattern. Um, a very wet uh, spring for the southern stations, decline in everyone in June, and then the west, western stations beginning to dry out at the end of the year. However, if we go down to 59 inches, almost five feet, it wasn't impacted at all. It stayed wet pretty much all year round, which is typically what we see at this depth. Things have to be really bad if we start seeing decline in soil moisture at this level. Now, Jim was talking about drought. These are maps for the U.S. Drought Monitor. Both Jim and I were talking about periods of dryness in April, June, and November. And while the U.S. Drought Monitor agrees with us, this is a map from April 26, 2016. And we do see that they're declaring some areas of Illinois about 13% abnormally dry, some here in the south, but mainly in the western part of the state. We look at the June period. We also see period, um, parts of abnormally dry southeastern Illinois, uh, northeastern Illinois around Will and Cook County, and, but mainly still, once again, in western Illinois. We also see some drought coming in, moderate drought here in the Peoria area and also in parts of western Illinois. And we look at November. Once again, we have some abnormally dry areas in western Illinois. That seems to be our take home point for this, as well as a band of dryness across central Illinois going across the state. Southern Illinois is seeing some dryness as well, as well as some uh, moderate drought here at the tip of the state. And in very southern Massac and Pope counties, we are seeing some severe drought. And now to talk about how this impacts the groundwater, we have Ken. I'm the manager of the Shallow Groundwater Network for the, the WARM program. And I'm going to go through kind of a little bit of what groundwater is, what we're me actually measuring, um, and then talk about the 2016 a little bit. If you've never seen groundwater before, there it is. That's groundwater. And this is about uh, 10 feet down, and it's uh, down South First Street here. And it's basically a trench, and, and this is what's, what would be considered water table conditions. It's not uh, soil moisture. There's a different difference between soil moisture, moisture and the water table conditions. And this is water table conditions. So now you've seen water table. Um, the definition, the, the formal definition of the water table is the zone of saturation that's open to atmospheric pressure. In terms of groundwater, there's several different layers and diff different 
uh, components of groundwater that we can talk about. This one is just open to the atmosphere, excuse me, open to the atmosphere. You can see in this block diagram that soil moisture at the top, then there's pore spaces that have some water in them, then there's a capillary rise or an area that the water table goes up and down. And that's what we're recording when we're doing the, in the shallow network here. Uh, diagram here, just want to kind of give you a familiarize you a little bit with what groundwater is and what's what's happening relation to related to the, the shallow system. Uh, we have a water table well on the side here on the left hand side and that, that's what our observation wells are looking at. We're looking at the water table conditions which is this line through here and it goes basically it's it uh, water table or the water actually underground moves towards discharge areas like streams, creeks, rivers, things like that. Um, there's an unsaturated zone where rainfall hits the top of it, some of it runs off, a percentage of that infiltrates into it. Then there's different layers here in, in this, this particular diagram that indicate uh, different, the path to that discharge area. The shallow systems, there's days or weeks potentially going to that discharge area. A little deeper when you get into an aquifer situation, uh, could be months to years, and then below that into what can what be considered confined system. Um, it would be decades or even and even longer than that. Um, I think that's all I want to mention here. Um, we're not in terms of the shallow network. We're not looking at actual aquifer systems. We're actually looking at water table conditions or just the the water that's below about five to ten feet, typically in Illinois. This is the network. We have 34 wells throughout the state. Um, scattered throughout. Some are more concentrated in areas than some, than some other areas. The data is available online. Uh, it's a daily, some of it's daily, some of it's monthly data. Uh, we're in the process of trying to, to get all this data together in an hourly format. Um, and I'll mention that just because the, the problem with, with this is that there's a period of record problem with the information that we're collecting here. We have 34 wells, about half of which were started, some of them were started in the 1950s in relation to a drought conditions. Uh, the group at the water survey thought it was necessary to look at shallow systems um, during the, or after the 1950 droughts, there were uh, nationwide droughts at that point in time. So they, they implemented a series of, they put in about 24 wells throughout the state. They were using old wells that people were not using any longer, all shallow wells. So they started some of these records back in 1950. You can see they go up to about 1985 in that, in that particular area. The ones that the ICN wells, the wells that, that we put in in 1996 to 2006, are all associated with the, the climate sites. We put a well at each particular climate site. So there's a period of record here. When you look at the statistics, uh, and trying to come up with some kind of a uh, average or deviation from normal, you have to be careful when you use this information because of that period of record problem. The older wells see a lot more variation. It's difficult to, it, it actually dampens and can sway your uh, statistics a little bit. These are the wells, the, the orange ones or the uh, yellow ones here are the wells that are, have the longer period of record and the other ones are the ICN stations just to give you kind of perspective in the state. So it's a pretty equal distribution, not great in the central part of the state. When you look at all the data together, this is the first time all this data has been put together in one particular table. Um, I divided it up by the, sec the areas that Jenny was talking about, the north, west central, central, or east central, and then the south. You can see in the, maybe embarrassing wise, the uh, central part, the east central part, where we're actually located has the least amount of wells. In, in the particular network. Um, we, should, we could rectify that and we probably will. Uh, a lot of the, the reason for that is because the older wells kind of fell off the, the grid in terms of um, this local area. A lot of people didn't want us to use those any longer. So that's the, one of the problems associated with that. When you look at deviations from norm, this is the um, 2016 deviations from normal for all the wells in those particular regions. So. You can see in the northern part of the, the, air, uh, the state, the um, deviations from normal were all above normal. In the central part, as we're talking about the drought conditions that kind of swept across the central part of the, the state in April, May, and June, then back in November, you can see the red is the west central, which is hit a couple more times, went below normal. 
the kind of the green there is the East Central, so it dipped in, in May and June, and then the South just the one time in June where it dipped below the, the deviations from normal. This is what they kind of the, each graph looks like in its particular location. So you can get kind of a feel for what was happening. And you can see that you know, through the central part of the state is where that, that drought condition or those, the drought potential uh, was happening in 2016. When you look at it, uh, the average of all those particular wells, all from that table, and look at it in relation to the, the statewide average rainfall, this is what you get. And you look at, you can see that there is only one area in June that the water levels or the deviations from normal actually went below normal for the whole state. So that's the difference in those when you look at the long period of record in all the wells versus just the, the, the small areas. Uh, in terms of kind of how this is, sits related to the other years that the information has been collected, this is uh, 17, in 17 years. When you look at the 15 wells, and this is that period of record problem again, when you look at the 15 wells, 2016 kind of falls in the, the sixth, fifth and sixth area, uh, wettest or above normal. Then when you look at all 34 wells, it kind of bumps up a little bit. Now why is this stuff important, the shallow systems? Well, this is uh, uh, out in Bonville. Bonville is about five, it's a research site about five miles west of here. We have an ICN well there, a shallow one. We have a, a shallow warm well there at Bonville. We have, and we have Muhammad well, or a Muhammad well, which Muhammad is the, basically the Muhammad aquifer system that we are drinking our water from. So it's, that's finished, that well is finished at about 200 feet deep. These shallow wells are anywhere from 15 to 20 feet deep in depth. So what I'm showing you here basically is that these, the green and the red are the ICN and the warm well. These dots here are the, the Muhammad system well. They move simultaneously. And the idea is to, to look at all these systems simultaneously because there is an impact. There are interconnections between the two. And that's about all I have for you. And Bill, Bill will go through the surface water components. Hi, my name is Bill Saylor. Am I on the thing? Okay. I'm going to be talking about the um, stream flow and lake levels, uh, surface water that we look at for the warm program. Um, in short order, talk a little bit about stream flow, um, which, which we um, use the USGS stream gauging network to get the data from uh, lake levels that we obtain monthly from lake operators. Uh, talk a little bit more about uh, what Jim mentioned about the, the flooding at um, the beginning of 2016, the end of 2015, and then briefly about Lake Michigan. Um, each month for the Illinois Water and Climate Summary, we look at the monthly average flow at these 26 stream gauging stations around the state. Um, we look at the average flow of, of the month that's just passed and relate that to the monthly average over the period of record of these gauges, which ranges anywhere from about 40 years to over 100 years. Uh, most of these are long-term stations. And then we come up with um, a sort of aggregated summation, really, aggregated rank um, as a statewide condition. Um, this is an example of uh, the data source uh, live on the web and uh, we're going to look at three example stations. Uh, for the 26 stations, uh, the water survey is a cooperator for, which basically means we pay for half of the operation of that gauge. Uh, before I do that, uh, I want to explain what, with respect to stream flow, what we reference as normal and that is the median value for the given time frame we're looking at over the period of record. So for this particular station, Salt Creek at Greenview, uh, you, you'll be seeing this, this line on the graphs here, which in this case, this is a, a daily graph. Over the 75 years of record, any given day, um, over the past 75 years, half of the values recorded 
at this station would be a higher than this value, than the given value on the graph, and half would be lower. This is where this particular watershed is, um, central Illinois. Uh, Bloomington Normal is in the upstream portion, as is Clinton Lake. And this is what we saw for 2016. Um, that meeting, by the way, shows a seasonal pattern, uh, lower in, in the fall generally and higher in the spring, and it goes like that through the year. Uh, my calendar here is a little bit longer than calendar year 2016 so that I can, we can see the effects of the um, antecedent conditions. But in general, you can see that the stream flow calculated uh, at this gauge was generally for most of the year higher than median, uh, some cases seasonally much higher. A little bit of a dip in June that we um, saw in some of the previous slides. Uh, this is a typical precipitation event where some amount of rain fell in the watershed here, took time, takes time to collect as Ken slide with the runoff and the base flow through the ground. The moisture will continue to move both downstream and down gradient in the ground and contribute to the, the base flow in the stream until the next event or series of events brings more water into the system. Um, was, what I found notable about 2016 is when we did have the precipitation even in the somewhat drier periods, it was fairly well spread out. So with respect to uh, stream flow and reservoir systems where there's some latency, um, this led to fairly higher flows and higher lake levels um, than average, basically. So this is an example of a central Illinois stream, 2016. And this is much above average, and we'll look at this a little towards the end in a bit more detail, that event through the state that Jim mentioned. Southern, southeast Illinois, here on the Little Wabash. Similar situation. Uh, the hydrographs look a little different, just exhibiting the different characteristics of the watershed, different slopes, topography, um, shape, uh, somewhat different pre precipitation also, of course, and uh, the soils are different. Um, so it tends to be what we call flashier. Uh, but the pattern is, is similar. Uh, in general, um, normal to above normal to much above normal compared with the median over time, a little bit dry in June. But in general, it's the same trends for 2016. Northern Illinois, uh, this example is a watershed of the upland areas in, in Wisconsin. This ends up flowing into the Fox River. Pecatonic River near Freeport, similar situation. In the monthly newsletter for the war program, the Illinois Water and Climate Summary, um, the, the aggregate statewide statistic ends up in, in this um, graph there on the right. My uh, pointer button is a bit sticky here. And above it is the precipitation summary for the month and below it the groundwater shallow, wall, uh, shallow well levels. And if you look vertically through them, you can see the lag in the stream flow and in the groundwater compared to the precipitation um, received generally in aggregate. So there is no uh, particular deficit in stream flow this year uh, in general, this last year. Okay, moving on to lakes. The Warm Reservoir Observation Network is basically uh, voluntary uh, reporters, uh, lake operators at these locations. Uh, most of these are public water supply reservoirs for community water supplies, or have been. And uh, they're mostly located in central and southern Illinois, uh, basically because there's um, fewer or few water public water supply lakes in the north because of the availability of groundwater. So this is uh, our area of interest here in the south. I'm going to give up on that. 
pointer. So Altamont Reservoir, uh, each of these systems uh, is, is, almost every one is unique in some way. Some have auxiliary sources to their lake. Um, some have paired lakes where they may pump water from one to the other. Altamont, this is down Effingham County, Long I-70, is pretty much a single lake and its inflow is the natural inflow from that watershed area. And this is what we saw in 2016. The, the blue line is the average over the uh, period of record that we've um, collected reports from them. And 2016, the, the lake was full or nearly full, as they would say. The horizontal line at the top is the, the spillway where the water flows over. Uh, this particular lake doesn't have active mechanisms to raise that or anything. It just fills up, and if it's higher than that, the water flows over. Um, this was actually fairly typical from most of those operators through the year. Lake is full. Even um, during the summer, there was not much decrease in water levels in, in a lot of lakes. Um, which you might typically see in a summer and fall season. One more example, Lake Springfield, uh, somewhat similar story. It's a more complicated system, but uh, again, in 2016, there was uh, plenty of water throughout the year, or at least stored in the reservoir. Okay, going back to the high water at the beginning of the year, this river gauge is uh, in the lower Illinois River um, in central Illinois, but the lower part of the Illinois River where the flow is calculated. And here again is the comparison with the long-term median daily and the peak there coming out of December. Um, at this point, Something like half the drainage area of the state contributes to this point. The flow's coming through there on its way downstream of the Mississippi. Uh, this graph takes the period of record at that gauge and shows the annual peak flows for each year or water year. And there on the right, I placed the 2016 point. Uh, which is still provisional, but um, so it, it was relatively high compared to a lot of years. Um, not a record there, but the, the data pretty much speaks for itself there. Havana is uh, slightly upstream, and this is the other way to look at it. Uh, river stage is, is the height rather than the flow. Uh, flow is generally calculated from height. But of course, as far as um, everything about floodplain management and flood fighting and uh, hazards and emergency responses, is, um, and predictions are based on flow, but the observations are generally height. This chart comes from the Department of Natural Resources from a publication uh, they put out in 2009 with some of the record peaks at this location. Um, and here are some of the subsequent peaks. We did have a big flood in 2009, very wet year. 2010, 2013, happened to be the record within the period of record. 2015, and there's the January 2016 for comparison. Um, I want to take this opportunity to note, too, you might be thinking, where's 1993 on that chart? Well, it, it's there. Uh, it's not the record. And that is an illustration that um, the same record event does not happen everywhere, even upstream or downstream. Um, the statistics are, are local. Um, even 95 that this location on the Illinois River was a, um, reached a higher stage than, than 93. Moving downstream, actually, to the, uh, to St. Louis on the Mississippi River. So the confluence of the Illinois River is, is above this. Um, this is where 2016 ranked on that. It has a much longer period of record at St. Louis. And it was, within the modern 
period of record. Um, a little further downstream, it, it was the highest flow, um, not higher than the estimated 1844 flood, but it didn't turn out to be the record. And downstream of here, downstream of Illinois, um, uh, the Army Corps was concerned through December and January about what actions they might have to take as that peak went uh, downstream. Um, Thebes is actually the, the southernmost, uh, downstream most gauge in Illinois. It's in Alexander County. Briefly, to end, uh, this is the Detroit District of the Army Corps' uh, summary of Lake Michigan levels. It's uh, it's, it's all average. It's average both spatially and temporally. Um, the start is monthly average levels, the red line in the middle. Um, it's an average actually of points around Lake Michigan and Huron, which are considered hydraulically the same. The blue line is the average, and we're, this is a chart of two years, 2015 and 2016. It too has a seasonal up and down pattern. And for the last two years, the average level in Lake Michigan has been above the long-term average um, within the period of record, which here is almost 100 years, by about a foot, foot and a half. The bars at the top are the high of that record, and the bars at the bottom are the lowest values seen, uh, which in 2012, the Lake Michigan level um, reached basically tied the previous low record. That's about a five foot difference between the record high and the record low. Um, by the end of 2014, uh, the Lake Michigan levels were back up to average or above average. But um, until 2012, there were several years where the Lake Michigan level was below average. This is our water and climate summary. So Illinois Water and Climate Summary available on our website, and it gives um, kind of the, the rundown every month. It's usually up by the 10th. 15th. 15th. <laughs> <laughs> and on the website, um, there are some interactive graphs. Uh, I can show you some screenshots. Uh, there's some for stream flow as well, and any, any number of other maps, charts, and information about the stations. I'm sure any of us would be happy to answer any questions, and thank you for your attention.